the humanities. So this address in Tilburg was an attempt to talk about the nature of the humanities. Um, and the kind of audience I was thinking of was partly within the School of Humanities because there were different departments and to promote internal coherence, to say, what do we have with each other? Why are we one school? But also an argument to the board of the university and to the fellow deans of the other schools. And Tilburg is a very society oriented one, the business and management, law, that kind of focus. And certainly there have been signals from the board that that was their priority rather than humanities. So saying, why do we have humanities within Tilburg? And also to the outside world in the Netherlands or abroad, saying, well, the humanities are important and Tilburg has its own contribution in that area. So clearly I was doing an inaugural address also with a certain, well, political purpose, academic politics, I mean. Um, after having been Dean, I had a study leave at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, early to 19, and that was the time to return to the, le to the inaugural address and start making that into a lo longer book. Uh, and that had a title, Human Humanities. Uh, that, that was my working title. And coming back to the question by, or the remark by Peter Harrison, yes, it is a matter of academic politics. It's a matter of rhetoric. Uh, that's even more so, I think, for the publisher. Publisher made the main, changed the main title and made the, the blurb, the text on the back page or uh, very urgent. The humanities are always in crisis and always need to defend themselves. Um, but I think the, the argument of the book is also that it is to some extent a meaningful category. And I also wrote so in a response to Peter Harrison. Uh, of course, it's easier for science, technology, mathematics. There are very substantial connections. One might speak of reductionism and the role of mathematics is very intrinsic. The life sciences is I think another new category where you have two fundamental theories, evolutionary biology and molecular biology, say a historical and a structural approach uh, that are very fundamental to the whole cluster of life sciences. For the humanities, it's more difficult because they're not automatically shared explanatory theories that have such a standing. So the coherence needs to be argued in a different way. And I think that's my main interest in, in doing it. And part of it is talking about um, different perspectives. And this is the introduction, actually, a few pages where I distinguish between canine, alien, and human humanities. If one thinks of a dog, dogs know they're humans, but it's very limited, very functional type of knowledge. They see the signals, uh, they know when they will get food or whatever. If one were to think of as a thought experiment of aliens, uh, extraterrestrials who would study humans, uh, that would be another, that could be a far more intellectual study of humans, far more conceptual, but it would be like we do zoology, like we study all kinds of animals or also other beings than animals. Uh, <clears throat> and not so much something we identify with. The aliens might say, well, they are interesting species, but it's like we studying jellyfish or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's others, it's clearly not ourselves. What is typical of humanities in the way we do it is that it's, we ourselves are doing it. Uh, humans engage humans. We are on both sides of the project. Uh, we are the ones who study and we are the ones who are studied. So there is a kind of, uh, co combined dimension. I think that is very central to the way I understand humanities. Another way to say the same is typically it has a kind of dual character. There is an outsider perspective. You can talk about uh, all kinds of historical periods, all kinds of groups in a third person uh, and trying to seek as objective knowledge as feasible. Uh, but there is also an insider perspective. There's a personal engagement. It's also about ourselves, our own identity and our relations to others. Um, one might say that that duality is also there for other disciplines, chemistry, a chemist consists of chemicals, but 
in fact, that doesn't have the same kind of feedback, the same kind of connection that it has in the humanities. It also has uh, applies for my earlier domain, I think, religious studies or theology and philosophy as well, that there is this mix of academic distance. One tries to understand, one's tried to describe as fairly as possible philological studies, historical studies, psychological studies, but it's also to some extent self-involving about one's own convictions and practices, one's own identity, arguments one considers valid. Uh, there is something that is more um, self-involving than academic study in, in the natural sciences. So I distinguish mainly two types of knowledge in the humanities. There is a part that is very much like knowledge in the sciences, knowledge of particulars, of a particular language, of a particular historical event, of a particular author, uh, and also a higher order type of knowledge of discerning patterns in those particulars. Language is an easy example, grammar. Uh, I think that's the focus of a book by a colleague from Amsterdam from some years ago, Rens Bott, A New History of the Humanities, The Search for Patterns and Principles from Antiquity to the Present. And he does that very well. He presents a very strong argument that there is this, this knowledge side that is even sometimes, uh, well, getting points before the natural sciences come to the same point. Uh, but I think there's a second element that's more specific to the humanities, and that is this uh, personal side that it's about understanding others, what moves them, how they see the world, and about self-understanding about this first perspe person perspective. And that's typical in philosophy and theology, but also in other disciplines like history. Uh, a lot of history is not just factual, but it's also uh, understanding the past and representing it in the present in relation to where are we? What kind of people are we? What's important to us? Um, so that gets me to an attempt to define the humanities. Uh, of course, many definitions might go through examples, listing a couple of disciplines, a kind of catalog, but I don't think that that is uh, a very helpful strategy uh, for this intellectual challenge of thinking about coherence. Uh, so I think it needs a different type of definition. A side remark, if you try to think about humanities, it sounds like a plural, but if you try to make the singular a humanity, that doesn't work in English. Uh, humanity is either a moral term, of course, crimes against humanity, or it's a kind of collective humanity as all those people, but it's not a single discipline. Whereas biology is a science, uh, there the word science can be for a singular, but that's a, a side remark. Uh, I, I work with a kind of tentative definition of the humanities, saying they are academic disciplines in which humans seek understanding of human self-understandings and self-expressions and of the way in which people thereby construct and experience the world they live in. Uh, it's, of course, also how it works out. Um, that's a second order activity. I mean, humans live, humans write, a, a, a novelist might write a book, and then someone in literary studies might study the novel or its reception or whatever. And it's also a third order activity. If you do a history of the humanities or a philosophy of the humanities, then you are still within the humanities, but you're also studying the humanities. And there is a feedback loop, uh, the study of humans, the humanities may influence the humans involved. And I think that's part of the complexity of, and also of the value of our disciplines, the cluster of disciplines relative to other domains. So that's the kind of introduction of, of the general theme and the general line of thought about the nature of humanities. That's why I use the title myself, Human Humanities. Uh, and contrast with very functional canine dog uh, perspective on humans or a uh, very distant alien perspective. <clears throat> um, this is more or less covering what I started. This is the table of contents of the book in the book in the introduction and the first chapter. The next three chapters I will get to in more detail 
are about those different aspects, about understanding others, about the self-involving character of the humanities, and also about the ambition to be knowledge, to be scholarship that is serious. And then the second part of the book is about who needs the humanities, and I will come back to that as well, talking about <coughs> humans and about the discussion on the value of the humanities. So that's the kind of outline of the remainder. So the first uh, next chapter is understanding uh, humans, understanding others. Uh, so kind of second perspective. And of course that involves particular types of knowledge. Uh, linguistic knowledge is often important part of it. So that's a major tool in understanding others, understanding their history, their context. We had in Leiden a huge cluster of area studies, especially Asian studies, uh, but also, of course, cultural studies might be seen in such a perspective, how the places, the, the, the way they construct their, their life worlds, their spaces. Uh, historically, that was often useful, both linguistic study, but also this regional study um, in terms of colonial service or trade, and nowadays in thinking about terror or nationalism. Uh, and the languages, of course, played a major role in education. So there's a whole uh, social context to those kind of projects, focusing on those disciplines. An example uh, in that knowing others of, of this feedback loop in the humanities, you've, uh, one example I discussed is a book series called Sacred Books of the East, started in the late 19th century, translating uh, manuscripts from India or China, <coughs> from Asia mostly. Um, and Friedrich Max Müller, the key figure there, was clearly trying to study others, like studying Indo-European languages, other areas, but also in relation to his own situation. And he said, well, they have their own Bibles. And so it became part of a kind of comparative study in which in the end, uh, his liberal Protestantism was the highest form of the spectrum of positions, but respectful about others as well. So you see this kind of relation to the topic studied, uh, not only for understanding them, but also in being a, a mirror or a source a resource for oneself. Uh, a side remark, it all, area studies shows that how difficult it is to do it by Discipline, for instance, philosophy is mostly a separate discipline or sometimes a separate school or faculty department. But Chinese philosophy is often studied in Chinese studies and so close to Chinese poetry rather than to philosophy. Things don't fit well in the same way. Our disciplinary landscape goes in detail for Western history, Western philosophy, and then clusters non-Western philosophy, non-Western history, uh, non-Western literature, not with literature or history or philosophy, but with um, non-Western studies. <clears throat> but anyhow, there is this part of understanding others that requires the study of them in terms of uh, learning their language, learning their history. And there is this more explicit self-involving side of how to relate to it. Um, traditional terms, hermeneutics, um, where it's a human necessity to interpret what others say, what others do, um, relating to others and their text, and also relating to our own past, because that's also others in a sense. And that's important in law and religion, uh, in culture, and raises all kinds of, well, issues about how to adjudicate, how to evaluate various interpretations. What makes for the validity? Should it be a relevance for us? Should it be <clears throat> what your original author intended, a whole kind of discussion on interpretation, typically for literary studies, cultural studies. One particular theme, oh, uh, hermeneutics takes its name from Hermes, or at least associated with the God who conveys messages, the messenger. <clears throat> One side issue about understanding others is that the insights that thus are gained or understand our own past may well be unwelcome. They they may be appreciated, 
and appropriated. For instance, this sacred books of the East was, I think, appreciated not only in the West, but also by Hindus and others as a kind of giving them part of their history and recognition. But it need not always be welcome. Typically in a Western context, at least from a religious studies perspective, biblical scholarship has often been sensitive uh, when Erasmus in the first version of the Greek version of the New Testament finds that particular passage on the Trinity is not there, uh, that becomes sensitive. Uh, and when Spinoza argues that the first books of the Hebrew Bible are not by Moses, that becomes sensitive for 19th century when there's a flood story uh, that predates biblical history. Um, those kind of historical insights may be challenging to some and of course unproblematic to others. So the whole field of discussions that one might say are about modernism, about adaptation or fundamentalism, about opposing particular knowledge is a kind of consequence of this self-involving character of such knowledge. Um, a recent, more recent example is a book by an American Chicago scholar, Wendy Doniger, a book on the Hindus, an alternative history, uh, which after a few years was taken off the market in India by Penguin because it triggered opposition, opposition especially from Hindutva, so the kind of leading Hindu movements of, of our time. <laughs> and that was a very interesting, book. the opposition was partly because she writes, calls it an alternative history. Uh, the cover, if one looks at it in detail, depicts Lord Krishna sitting on kind of horse-like structure, which is made up of naked women. Uh, and in the book, she argues for kind of sexual dimension in Hinduism, uh, but also for um, that meat has been eaten uh, long before vegetarianism or at least certain forms of vegetarianism became prominent that there was far more violence than the idealization of of non-violence uh in in modern hinduism um, makes one think and so she's opposed for for offering a picture of hinduism that is not the self-image of current hindus or at least of leading hindus of our time. And that gives a kind of confrontation as it. She says, well, uh, <clears throat> that's the Hinduism, this kind of Puritan Hinduism of meditation, nonviolence, vegetarianism, that the Hindu Fadis are defending, while they deny the one that the Christian missionaries hated and that I love. So she links it back to colonial history and said, well, this Puritan strength actually came with the British missionaries and was a appropriated by the Hindus, and then, um, and they objected to understanding certain <coughs> um, objects as sexual symbols and, and other things. Um, so she prefers actually the kind of low culture, pluralistic, open-ended, satirical Hinduism. And uh, the other ones, they are not having the true image of Hinduism, and I'm defending it against them. The interesting um, realization here is that uh, Hindus are offended, but that the author then said, well, but you only have a very partial understanding of your own tradition, and I have a richer understanding. So it's a very uh, back and forth, in a sense, between uh, who, who is to speak for Hinduism. And she said, well, <clears throat> I'm not claiming to be a Hindu, but I speak for elements that I find in the tradition that are suppressed nowadays. So the, the, that's the part about understanding others as a major part of the humanities and its, its political consequences, its involvement, its sensitive dimension, the call for respect, uh, which is not a scholarly criterion. And she says, well, I respect it in a sense. I study it seriously, but I offer a different voice on that than you do. Uh, the other dimension, say a first person relationship, is about self involvement. As I said, it's also relevant outside philosophy and theology, uh, historical studies, linguistic studies. <clears throat> we study the past from our present, and we 
talk about it again today in relation to issues of interest, but it jumps out most strongly in philosophy and theology. Philosophy, talk about arguments and judgments, tends to have very universal ambitions, the classic idea of the enlightenment, uh, ideals that are intellectual ideas, logic, or moral values that are valid for all. Um, and if, if one were to reach those, uh, and of course it can always be disputed how far one gets, but uh, and comes to a certain conclusion, that's not just a description, oh, well, people think this is uh, the most important value. But if you come to that conclusion, you can't say, but I don't care, because that, or of a certain argument, yes, this argument is valid, but I don't care. That seems to be against the spirit of philosophy, then you have to give further arguments why it's not the right perspective on those issues. So by, by nature, in a sense, the philosophical judgments are self-involved. At least that's what I think gives it its peculiar particular position and relevance and challenge. Um, not everything that's important is universal. Uh, I quote Susan Wolf, but there's also Harry Frankfurt, for instance, who makes a similar, offers a similar argument. Uh, she says, when I visit my brother in hospital or help my friend move or stay up all night, sew my daughter a Halloween costume, I act neither for egoistic reasons nor for moral ones. Rather, I act out of love. So she says, well, there are those universal reasons, moral ones, or self-interest. Those are the kind of standard categories. But there is also this, I act out of love, out of a personal relationship, out of personal commitment, out of particular identity, the people I relate to. And that <coughs> uh, that is also self-involving. So this universal is self-involving because we are part of that universal valid for all. But also this personal dimension is part of what we address in the humanities. And that's the, the sphere of, of particular identities, including collective identities that are shaped as religions. Um, and they have a difficult place in the sphere of the university. Modern universities have uh, no difficulty accepting the kind of ambition for third person knowledge for that aspires to be objective, factual, and of course develops into theoretical knowledge as well. Uh, and of course, there is a pragmatic side to it, which languages, which cultures are studied. Um, <clears throat> some are, well, more relevant, socially speaking, than others. And philosophy is accepted, in, I think, and present in almost all modern universities due to its ambition to be universal and to be reflective on our arguments and values. But the place of, of the more particular preferences is a challenge. So that's a challenge on the place of theology in the university. And in my book, I take the liberty to talk about the Dutch history in that perspective, one that predates the free university, 1876. There is a new law on higher education that separates church and state more explicitly for the theology faculties and introduces two new disciplines, history of religions, plural, so of non Christianity in a sense, and philosophy of religion, rather than systematic theology or dogmatics, as a kind of neutral approach to religious issues. And then the church professors are separate, not professors of the university, but professors with the university. Um, well, that has been a model in the Netherlands. Of course, we have other models as well. The Free University is typically another arrangement. But this, this separation model, uh, and it worked for a century, but it has evolved over time to religious studies, a study of religions, and not much of the explicit institutional reference has remained. <clears throat> and other models have been somewhat more successful in having a separate type of institution for this engaged type of study, University of Humanistics, the Protestant Theological Unit, University and so on. And we have the broader 
institution like the Free University in Tilburg and Nijmegen that have a religious background and in principle that is relevant to all the university as a whole. But there are other models elsewhere, the German model of Catholic Faculty, Evangelische Faculty. There's a whole uh, world of discussion that could be developed. Anyhow, it shows that there is a certain difficulty, I think, for the academic world to accept this particular, the role of particular preferences, but still also an interest in having that on the academic podium as part of what is studied, not just historically as a kind of out there, but also as relevant to those who are studying it, as relevant to the society in which it is studied. So the self-involving side is, is important. The third side so speaks about knowing others, about self-involvement, about scholarship, responsible scholarship. Uh, so that's more the ambition for objectivity. Um, and there I say, well, that's a moral issue as well. Being reliable is morally important. It's a classic statement, 19th century thinker, William Clifford, mathematician, that is an essay, The Ethics of Belief. And it had not only an example on um, someone sending a ship off to sea and not checking well whether it was seaworthy, but also of uh, telling, spreading gossip about a particular religious community. Um, and if that is gossip and it still has consequences in the behavior of people, <clears throat> then that is a moral issue. And he makes a high, puts a very high norm that nothing should be distributed, nothing should be believed unless you're really sure. But anyhow, that issue is in many ways still ours. Uh, there's a um, book of about 10 years ago about merchants of doubt, how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. The whole issue about, um, well, major developments and how they affect health and commercial interest pushing for <coughs> playing it down. Um, more closer to the humanities is an essay by Daniel Dennett, where he talks about a virus that raises infant mortality and strengthens the power of a local ruler, a local despot. And then he says, well, this virus is not a molecule, it's not a, a biological virus, but it's an idea, a meme, namely the idea that science is itself a colonial imposition. So Dennett speaks in favor of the sciences, Western science, um, and says, well, that's important. And that, that trick is a, an entry into a broader debate about, say, the moral responsibility of good scholarship. And he raises the idea, do philosophers also need malpractice insurance? Could they do something wrong that has consequences? And of course, to some extent, yes, the humanities can influence, have consequences beyond their own domain, say, in art history or whatever the statements you make. Um, with that, I think comes the argument for the value of, well, value-free scholarship, not really value-free, of course, but avoiding partisan bias as a quality issue. There are always values involved, professional values about social co collaboration, uh, safety, um, and so on, and epistemic values about aiming for precision and reliability, but to suspend personal preferences. The analogy is a referee in sports may well personally prefer one team over the other, but that should not work in the, in the role as a referee. So there's sensitivity there. So there's a, a particular type of ambition to be value free, which I think should also work in the humanities, for instance, religious studies. Uh, and this is also where one gets to, is it similar to the natural sciences? I think to some extent, yes, of course, there is this similarity in seeking reliable knowledge, but there are also fundamental differences. Uh, physical laws, they're unavoidable. Gravity is there. Also when you're flying and seem to be overcoming gravity, but that the law is still valid. Political laws are prescriptive. They tell you what to do, but laws in linguistics are neither. Uh, they can be violated and they may be violated. Poet may be creative and say something in a way that 
goes against what is normal and it's still interesting language. So there is something else and that's kind of more general pattern, I think, in human insight into the way one is seen by others in the way regularly things develop may influence behavior. People may then go against what is predicted of them, self-denying behavior or, or do as predicted. So there is a kind of option for first person, the actors to go against what the external perspective, the scientific kind of perspective, scholarly perspective on them is. So that's the kind of brief tour of the kind of three key issues, understanding others on self-involvement and on uh, the normative uh, uh, ambition to have good scholarship. The later part of the book and of my argument is about who needs the humanities. Well, some need interpretation, so professionals in law and in religious studies and other areas. Um, I also say it's part of, of human nature. Uh, humans are multiple beings in the sense that already came through in, in the previous sections. Uh, humans are part of, fully part of nature. Uh, this painting by Magritte is what it's not. And a statement by John Dewey, mountain peaks do not flow unsupported and humans too. They do not even rest upon the earth. They are the earth in one of its manifest operations. Um, well, and in the biological sphere, so humans are material and it's a possibility of material reality to, to form culture. And there is in this biological sphere, an interesting feedback always. And that's the, the, the complicating. Humans are also um, cultural beings using language and language brings about puts on the table more than just what's there. It's more than just pointing to things. It can also be talking about what's not there, about plans or hopes or dreams. Uh, language of worlds used, it comes from Clifford Geertz, models of the world, trying to understand our world, but also models for the world, visions of where we would like to go. Another way to talk about the same science and ethics. And this distinction between those two is, I think, a val valuable one and a valid one. But in human life, we have both. So that brings about some of the complexity. And of course, the complexity increases with modern culture um, as technology changes our world, but also, also our relations, our self-image. Uh, a novel like Dave Eggers, The Circle, brings about that. And that book has a title, The Circle, and the question is whether the circle will close. It's a big company like Facebook or something like that. And it has logically a problem that is well illustrated by the <coughs> nurse on the roster um, advertisement who holds a box with a nurse on it, who holds a box with a nurse on it, and so on. Uh, there's a, a logical challenge there, whether that can be complete. But I know humans are material beings, but we are also cultural and, and technological and thereby self-changing. Um, I get to the last part of it, the last chapter, uh, talk about the value of the humanities. I argue that that can be discussed in three different ways. First, with Jan Spot's example, I talk about value of fundamental knowledge. And that is typical, like one might argue for astronomy or some other discipline in natural sciences, not immediately useful, but use may come much later. And Spolt argues the discovery of the grammar of Sanskrit long ago uh, has been useful in constructing computer languages. Or the rise of biblical criticism comparing different manuscripts of the same text has been useful in learning how to reconstruct on the basis of genetic information, uh, histories of various species. So there may be fundamental knowledge or fundamental skills that are useful that are valuable but we don't know it and just doing fundamental research is a, a valuable activity i think that's a, a good argument but it's an it can't be the full argument uh then there is a kind of second argument that it's useful 
uh, certain languages are useful to have. Uh, uh, some years ago, the leading person of the and uh, what is the bond for all names, the employers society said we need more people who know German because that's our main trading partner, uh, or we need people who know Chinese and understand Chinese culture if we do business there. Uh, there was in our my time in Leiden a brief study comparing uh, those in the uh, humanities broadly conceived in Leiden to the sciences and saying, well, actually there are more companies that are coming out of, as a kind of flow off from the university that have a humanities background and they even employ more personnel. So it's not just one person kind of offices, but also uh, multiple person. <clears throat> they did have play a trick because they did include uh, law, for instance, among the humanities and so on. So there was, it's more than the more narrowly defined humanities. But anyhow, uh, there is in, um, well, in, in trade and relations to other parts of the world and in cultural, intercultural issues and so on. There are many places where humanities knowledge is useful. If you think about society, uh, an example I once picked up on environmental issues, if you want to clean the main river in India, the Ganges, uh, you need to know its cultural meaning as well. And uh, addressing terrorism or international violence needs uh, knowledge of languages, histories, and so on, or addressing hesitancy on modern medicine or vaccines is not just a technical issue, but it's a cultural issue. More broadly speaking, education, a teacher needs to know more than the teacher teaches. You can teach, say, languages, and then students may raise questions saying, well, this is similar to another language. How does it work? And at that point, it's good if there's some broader knowledge than just the, the primary teaching focus or data science and needs reflection on, on culture in which it lands or uh, which it reshapes. So for any almost any topic, there are societal challenges involved and the, those involve understanding of, of cultural dimensions, of human dimensions. And there's another argument that the humanities and rich culture that contributes to the preservation of our cultural heritage uh, understanding. I think that's true, but I think it sh we should not be too much focused only on high culture. Uh, one, it did emerge without the humanities. It did emerge because there were persons doing it and not because there was an academic project. And academic reflection might be counterproductive even if you're too much reflecting upon it, uh, you lose kind of spontaneity or immediateness, just as religious studies need not necessarily support religious practice. There's also a kind of voice that says, well, being useless is itself useful. Having a domain of contemplation need not pay off via action. I don't think actually that that's too helpful in the context of academic politics. This rhetoric interest in defending um, the position in the university. Uh, there was a few years ago by Martin Nussbaum, a book on democracy, why democracy needs the humanities a subtitle, not for profit. And this comes from one of the early pages. We are in the midst of a crisis of massive proportions, grave global significance. The future of the world's democracies hangs in the balance. What are these radical changes? The humanities and the arts are being cut away in both primary, secondary, college, university education. So I th she makes a, a case that loss of the humanities in education is itself a threat to democracy. I find that somewhat an overstatement. Um, their literacy is important, but, but academic study of the humanities, there are many academic ex examples of, of academics in totally different disciplines who have been moral leaders. Uh, Sakharov, a Russian physicist, may count as a one example among many. Um, and also it may be too optimistic about humanity scholars. They are not necessarily all highly moral or highly humane. 
a colleague of mine in 20 years ago, <coughs> Paul van Dijk, uh, said, well, he was teaching ethics. He said, don't claim too much for the ethicist like an uh, um, old hairdresser. A hairdresser need not have a lot of hair himself or herself. Uh, the color copper. And that was a short phrase that says, well, it doesn't necessarily work that the object of study makes also for those involved. So there's a certain ambivalence about Nussbaum's argument, I think, that the humanities are they're too much expected of the humanities. Dim, may, may I ask where we are time-wise now in your presentation? Uh, we get to the last sheet. This oh, is no, the except sheet. for the no, except for the responses, but close to the end. Uh, so my, the, my first argument about the value of humanities is uh, knowledge. The second is usefulness in various ways. And the third is kind of anthropological. It is part of what we are as humans. It's our nature to be reflective. We not only communicate and do things, but re reflect on it. We not only have a culture, but we are revising it, creating it. So humanities are natural to humans and necessary for the good of complex society. Not all reflection is academic, but this is among the important human and humane things we can do. That's the kind of concluding sentences of the book. Um, quick about responses. So there was in this journal site on a set of five responses to the, to the book, um, mostly very friendly, but, but bringing up their own points. I already referred to Peter Harrison saying, well, the disciplinary landscape is contingent. Yes, but I think philosophically there is still a case that can be made that this is a meaningful category. Uh, Michael Roos, philosopher of biology, says, well, I ha don't have interest in the other humanities. I don't care. And I only care basically about the help the humanities can give to the hard sciences, say in discussing creationism or topics like that, or clarifying biological concepts. Yes, that's fine, but I don't think that takes away that there is this uh, challenge, but also this possibility to think about the humanities as a domain with some coherence. Dr. Sotati, a theologian at a liberal arts college, says, well, this is important because it brings out a difficult issue about the self-involving character in an academic environment and how to do it and to do it in close proximity. He says there's no solution, but there but it's important to do it both and to do it in a single environment. The second, the last two responses, and this is really the last sheet, were by Lisa Stenmark, a theologian, religious studies person, who was most critical. She said, well, this book on the humanities is typically offering a Western perspective, a colonial perspective. Uh, she says, this is about Western knowledge. And she goes against this chapter on responsible scholarship saying, well, it should be far more partisan. You should side with it. My concern is with this Hindu example, if you side with those in the non-West, you might well be finding yourself siding with a particular party in that world rather than with others. <clears throat> the contrast is with Donald Drakeman, uh, someone who has a background in law, religious studies and engineering. And he says, well, the issue on which we agree um, is that's probably generating the strongest opposition at the moment is the idea that there should be academic distance from political and ideological interests. That scholarship should be value free. And that's important to have an environment characterized by civility and patience. He writes also from the American context, just as the other one does. Anyhow, that's the tension. Uh, and I recognize myself more in this last author uh, response than in the preceding one. That's the kind of a reflection as I develop it in the book. Yes. Thank you very much, Vim, for um, for your talk. Um, I make the following proposal that we um, take a two minute break and then we uh, return to our screens and then there will be the opportunity to um, ask questions. And the way I'd like to proceed there is, um, as we do it in other meetings uh, in the departments, that you announce through the uh, through the chat 
that you want to ask a question. And on the order of income, we'll just um, proceed and I'll give the words to the person who's then on. So let's um, reconvene on my watch, it's uh, um, 55. So let's return at 57 and then we go to the second part of this meeting. Again, thanks very much, Wim, for this uh, lucid presentation. All right, I think we've used up our two minutes. Um, so to get our minds properly organized for the question uh, session. So please announce in the chat whether you want to uh, um, discuss things that uh, Wim has brought to the floor. Um, Perhaps I may start with uh, with a question, uh, Wim. It's about your your definition of the humanities. Uh, so you said. Uh, so I read from your book on page twelve, where you took the quotation from: "Humanities are academic disciplines in which humans seek understanding of human self-understandings, and of human self-expressions, and of the ways in which people thereby construct and experience the world they live in." So this, so here, um, the humanities are a highly reflexive uh, undertaking, and I was worried about two things. First, doesn't this exclude, for instance, history as being among uh, the humanities? So, I mean, lots of things that historians are doing is not uh, seeking understanding of human self-understanding. They try to understand, let's say, the causes of the French revolutions or how certain uh, what, what a particular sequence of events uh, was over time so that's one question and secondly does this definition really make some sort of a distinction between the humanities on the one hand and the social sciences on the other it would seem that this is this definition really encompasses encompasses political science social science um, parts of psychology and so forth uh yes um on the first part i i don't think it excludes history and i already said some uh, made some remarks 
of course, I do think that we do a lot of history in relation to, uh, well, current interests and not just as a kind of factual finding, but in order to, to reflect upon who we are uh, or there's often, well, of course, the bad side of it is has been a lot of national history of writing that has been very partisan. But but to some extent, something similar goes on, I think. So it's, history is studying the past, trying to understand causes. But those causes include uh, the humans who were were active at the time, who, who had certain, for instance, the French Revolution. Uh, the causes is not just... Uh, well, kind of chemistry or physics, but it's also who were those actors? What were they uh, convinced? What were their their ideals and so on? Um, so I, I, I do think that in a sense, some forms of linguistics, for instance, say studying, uh, get much closer to cognitive science, uh, studying brain processes in relation to <coughs> linguistic utterances. That may be more more science like, life science like than than uh, humanities, but so, so uh, boundaries are are not sharp. But I mm-hmm. but I I'm less troubled about excluding history. Uh, the distinction with social sciences, to some extent, again the boundary is not sharp. Uh, uh, for instance, cultural anthropology could easily fit under humanities, as I understand them. Um, a lot of it, say sociology, tends to, or political science, if it tries to discuss, say, the political preferences of people, uh, it tends to to be kind of sociological in orientation, trying to talk about them, saying, well, they have this kind of education, that kind of of uh, background, without involving their individual uh, preferences, without involving their individual uh norms and that may be very effective in making predictions large-scale predictions but it doesn't really address uh the individual uh with his or her convictions so i think that that even that in a sense then uh the social sciences are less interested in this kind of first person perspective and more in the behavior the kind of collective behavior that flows from it than the humanities. Okay, thanks, thanks much. There's, I think there's a lot to be said about it, but this is um, this is surely a good start. Um, so, um, at this moment, um, is there anybody else who wants to? Can, can I raise a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, oh. just to be sure. Um, uh, the, the 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 proposed procedure was to announce in the chat oh, that you want to ask a question. I, so I don't as uh, as of now I I don't seem to be seeing those. Um... Renee, so I think Iris has a question, and Edwin and I've got a question. So at least three. Okay. I think Rick was first. Well, Rick was first. Okay. Oh, that's not why I said it, but. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm happy to ask a question. So yeah, so uh, my also my question also relates to the definition or analysis of the humanities that, that you provided both in the book and in the presentation today. So I was not entirely convinced by it either. And I do realize that it's to some extent arbitrary, but maybe we can do a slightly better job than um, or slightly improve on the one you provided. So my worry was also that uh, kind of standardly or traditionally fields like ethics and epistemology also fall under the humanities. And one might think that, or metaphysics, and one might think that their objects are abstract entities, right? So they are, they exist even independently of human beings. So I, I take it you don't want to build in relativism from the very start. And similarly, you might think that for certain uh, theological disciplines like systematic theology that have objects beyond humans and what humans created, such as creation or God or angels or whatever. Um, and also the other way around, you might think that some of the sciences study uh, objects made by humans, such as uh, um, artistic objects, right? So you can use, um, you can study the chemical composition of a painting, and that doesn't make it um, a piece in, uh, in humanity studies. So, um, so my worry then is that 
in your definition, you cache it out entirely in terms of the objects. And one suggestion I would like to make is why not also appeal to the methods? So in a, in a definition, combine the objects or maybe aspects or properties of the objects with particular methods. Wouldn't that be closer to the truth to the extent that there is a truth out there? Um, yes, uh, may well be. I, I weaseled out by calling it a tentative definition. So it's in a sense uh, a definition for the project, uh, uh, arguing that that brings out those those different dimensions of scholarship, but also of personal involvement. Um, yes, uh, I'm afraid talking about methods opens up again a, a huge variety of methods that are used. So whether that really uh, gets me any closer to to an argument, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think for now that's... Okay, fair enough, yep, thank you. All right, so next next in line then was uh, Iris. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me well. Thank yes. you for your uh, talk, first of all. Um, I had a somewhat different question, um, and this uh, it relates to um, what do you think humanities education is for? You talk about humanities as a scholarly activity, but I was also wondering um, in relation to uh, education, and this uh, also uh, came from last week, I attended a talk from a professor in space engineering, and she basically gave a pep talk, say, join the STEM sciences to join us in our mission to Mars. And this sort of raised the question for me, um, we don't make this type of um, statement in the humanities, so that raised the question to me for what is humanities education? For, and it, this is also something I think Nussbaum alluded to in her book. Uh, and I was wondering what your view on this uh, is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, the level kind of uh, where Nussbaum's argument is, I think, to the point is uh, education in the sense of literacy and of being uh, citizens, having a sense of, of a kind of broader political context. Uh, I think that's a, a sphere where some basic knowledge of the humanities of or of a kind of humanities orientation uh, of history and, and culture is is valid for all uh we in Netherlands, of, she works in a liberal arts environment in the united states where uh where it's it's a broad basis at the liberal arts whereas most of us work of course with a choice uh, in the academic sphere from the beginning uh you do law or or physics or whatever particular disciplines. And there, I, I do think that you, uh, this is not the discipline that all should choose, but that some should choose. That is important. For instance, this Mars expedition, uh, that will not just be an engineering effort. That will be much more than an engineering effort and, and the communication around it as well. Uh, so that there's more involved uh, in, in such issues, that kind of, argument about usefulness in various domains, I think applies there. Um, so what's the argument? Uh, well, I think, as I see it, the first argument that I would like to make is, uh, if you want, if you're interested, this is a very interesting sphere and it's very human important to do it. So if you're interested in history or interested in languages or uh, philosophy, uh, go for it. Uh, the second is that it's useful. Uh, I quote also someone who says, well, in a culture that's more and more technological, we also need people who, who relate to technological to the human, uh, because it's not just about the technology, the engineering, but it's also about how, how we do deal with that. Uh, and there, he, he thinks there's a huge job market uh, in that sphere. So it's that kind of cultural uh, sensitivity bringing in, in a broader context. I think those are the two, it's interesting, it's it's attractive in itself, and it's also important to society, not at the expense of other projects, but alongside the, the whole COVID epidemic is not just about devel developing uh, uh, vaccines. It's It shows that it's much more about accepting it, but also about a culture and, and what it does to human relationships and so on. Yeah, so 
Thanks. I mean, I think there most people that are attending this talk here would say that the humanities are useful and interesting. Uh, but then the question becomes, how do you also ensure funding? Because the humanities are, of course, severely underfunded in a lot of parts of the world. So maybe that also becomes then an important question. Yes, and I, I don't say. give the answer. In the, in the book, I try not to, to do too much of the academic politics issue itself, but just to think through the kind of question that came to me first. Well, if I've seen Leiden, and then I've seen Tilburg, they're so different, and they're both called schools of humanities. What? How can I understand the word humanities uh, so that it is appropriate both to this kind of historic and uh, linguistic traditional humanities school and also to a more contemporary uh, one set in a technological culture? All right, thanks much, uh, uh, Wim. Edwin, I think you're on now. Uh, hi, Wim, and nice to see you after so many years, and uh, many thanks for your talk. Um, yesterday, I was looking into this book of Stefan Collini, What mm -hmm. Are Universities For? And he uh, is writing a bit about the special character of the humanities, and then he makes the qualification, uh, a, qualitative sorry, a, a qualitative distinction between knowledge and understanding. And he's, uh, he writes that knowledge can be seen as skills together with information, and understanding can be understood as experience together with reflection. And then he says that the goal of the humanities is more close to understanding. Now, I was just curious what you think about this uh, distinction. Yeah. Um, the, I, I haven't read everything of Colini, but, but this book has inspired the title of, of my book uh, in the end. Uh, and he has, has there's there's a lot I sympathize with. Uh, I'm not sure I well I didn't use this kind of way of of making it because I I want to claim that it's also about knowledge that that is that it's not uh, safe in a sense I think to move away too far from claiming that there's also this knowledge element to humanities um, and understanding. Uh, but and so I, I don't want to, to to do too much with that distinction. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I have to think about it. Yes. Uh, maybe a follow up question later. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, anybody else? Martin, did I see your hand? I think James has a question. Yeah, sorry, my mic was off. Uh, I couldn't find it. Yeah, I, I thank you very much for your presentation. I do have a question, and that is actually it's a follow up on uh, your reply and your response to Rene's first question. Um, if you say that the distinctive feature is the first person perspective, then I'm still wondering about those parts of the social sciences in which the first person perspective. Um, is more central like anthropology or basically um, qualitative approaches within the social sciences emphasizes the importance of this. So I was wondering whether your arguments also then apply to those parts of the social sciences. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think the boundary is too, too strong there. So it's easier to make the, the distinction with, with the physical sciences uh, than the social sciences. And I I certainly uh, think that cultural anthropology, for instance, uh, has a lot of uh, connections. Uh, Clifford Geertz, for instance, is himself, or was, uh, started in a sense as a humanities scholar. He writes in his autobiography, uh, clearly uh, relates to this, this internal or cultural perspective as well. Um, so the boundary is, is somewhat fluid, but I, I do think that uh, the, well, the, the kind of experimental side of, of the psychological and social sciences, uh, trying to do tests with groups of people, that typically tries to abstract from, from this, this first person 
engagement. Well, you, you already said something in that direction by by speaking of qualitative um, social sciences. Yeah. Um, a difference of philosophy of the social sciences, uh, Martin Hollis has a lot of, uh, well, a lot of humanities elements there as well. And he clearly does so in his philosophy of the social sciences. So yeah, the boundary is is not too strict. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm safe there, but. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks much. Then I think uh, in the order of business now it would be James McAllister first. Welcome, uh, James. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and uh, and hello to Vim from his uh, old stomping ground in uh, in Leiden. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with everyone uh, and this uh, wonderful group. Um, I have a question uh, for Vim about um, uh, the role of uh, continental philosophy in his project. It seems to me that um, your approach was uh, largely uh, informed by analytic philosophy, which traditionally has been uh, the ally of uh, mathematics and the natural sciences, whereas um, continental philosophy to a very large extent has been a project uh, of uh, reflection on the status and the methods of uh, the uh, Geisterswissenschaften. Uh, so just, just to mention one uh, insight, uh, the idea that um, we approach uh, the uh, objects of study of the Geisteswissenschaften from the inside, whereas we approach the objects of the natural sciences uh, purely from the outside. This is similar to, but not the same as, uh, the difference between a first person and a third person perspective. Um, so my question is, uh, what, what, what do you think of this? What do you think of the idea that we can't properly understand the humanities without referring in a, in a heavy way uh, to continental philosophy uh, and 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 what so what's your what's your what's your take uh, on on this suggestion? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think in a historical sense, it certainly involves uh, would involve uh, well a lot of nineteenth century Diltai and others uh, philosophy, um, and I do occasionally in the book refer to to them and I picked up some learned some some Kant and from uh, Marcus Duell, I see, and, and um, Justin Mill in Rotterdam and, and colleagues in a project. Um, I don't think I, I so I, and I at, at the heart of it, I think, is in the end, a kind of argument that is more the continental type of argument in philosophical anthropology, that that we have these two perspectives of, of dealing with the world and uh, and of being, um, well, participants in it, uh, say Kant's distinction between practical philosophy and theoretical philosophy of trying to understand it and and, and acting in it, or many other ways of, of trying to approach the same kind of duality. Um, maybe the tone is more the the analytical one, because that, that comes to me more easily, uh, also in my own biography. Uh, but I don't think that the distinction really makes, well, makes me fit into one rather than the other. Okay, thanks much. Uh, next is uh, Roland Den Boef. Hello, so thank you for uh, the lecture. It was really fascinating. Um, I kind of want to um, add another, uh, question about the distinction or, or ways in which you can distinguish the humanities from the social sciences. Because, I mean, so, so you, you can reply, your main reply here is that the boundaries aren't that strict. Uh, there would be another potential reply, I think, would be to say, well, I mean, parts of psychology, uh, cultural anthropology, perhaps, they're better classified as the humanities. So you just say, well, some of, some things we actually call in, in the same sense as we do when we're trying to do conceptual analysis in philosophy that we sometimes say well, some of the uh, the intuitive judgments are going to be sacrificed for the sake of a coherent conception so um, what do you think in general about that kind of reply well just say that uh, uh, the inability of, of this definition of the humanities to cover all the 
the, the um, traditional um, uh, judgments about what is part of the humanities and what isn't, that those traditional uh, judgments may be mistaken and really shouldn't be, uh, that, that shouldn't be held against uh, your uh, definition of the humanities. What do you think about the general strategy? Yes, I think that's more or less, I, I would respond also to the challenge by Peter Harrison saying, well, yes, uh, in the distinction between social sciences and humanities, as it is found in, in universities, uh, that's a historically contingent feature. So he's right there. And maybe some elements could better be placed elsewhere. And some, some elements of psychology develop into uh, life sciences in a sense, uh, with, uh, and some elements of cultural anthropology, for instance, could easily be in a humanities school. So those, uh, the way the actual classification nowadays is, uh, is not totally in line with, with the kind of conceptual emphasis in, in the definition. Yeah, I think whether that would be a proposal for a reform, a reorganization of the university, I don't think so. I, I, but I do think it, it, yeah, it addresses that that kind of. It doesn't fit totally with current faculties. Yeah, so be it. All right. Um, next is uh, Marcus Duell. Welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, perhaps two short comments to the discussion one would be uh, is it really the best idea to define the humanities via methods or via the overall goal of the enterprise so that you say specific kind of investigations uh, make sense in the line of specific uh, overall questions but uh, when it comes to the methodology uh, the humanities can be quite diverse and quite integrative. Um, that's the first point. And the second, I'm <clears throat> not completely happy with the definition of the humanities as dealing with the first person perspective only, but uh, relating. So, so you could say we have at least three uh, relationships. We have, we can think about objects, we can think from our subjective perspective and in a social perspective. And it's not more the idea of the humanities to think about the relationships between these perspectives and possible tensions between them. So that, uh, I mean, <clears throat> if you would go in this direction, it would cover much more aspects of the humanities. And uh, perhaps it would make it a, yeah, much more, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and enterprise which is much more directed as, yeah, orienting ourselves and the world in a broader sense. Yeah, uh, I think the first one, I, I agree, the concern about methods, this diversity of methods is, I think, uh, important and, and, well, so it doesn't get, get us out of the, the pluralism that characterizes the humanities and the, the challenge to find some formula. Uh, talk about the relations. Yes, I. so in a sense, the three chapters I, I emphasized are doing the second person, first person, third person. Um, but in, in those contexts, I think the relationships, for instance, that this kind of knowledge about others might not be received well or or might be appropriated uh i think those relationships are are there all the time uh so i'm not not denying that it's more well kind of organizing scheme that that those three uh perspectives uh work well for this kind of uh, well maybe kind of introductory book i mean i don't claim that this is as a, a kind of broad philosophy of the humanities in, in a kind of definite sense. It's more uh, the challenge that I faced as a 
well, being involved in academic, uh, res being responsible academically for, for rather diverse schools and how to think about it. Uh, so yeah, the relation between those three perspectives maybe could have been an organizing principle, but I, I anyhow, I, I wouldn't deny that at all. And of course, I also play uh, with the first person. Um, there's also this thing between singular and plural in a sense, we or I, and I didn't do much about with that distinction and, and those two possibilities. That also makes it more uh, rich, but also more complex. Um, I saw that uh, Martin has a follow-up uh, question. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I was, again, it's the same topic, but I was wondering, um, I mean, I'm slightly worried about this, the, the, the unintended consequences of demarcating the humanities in the way that you do, because there is a, there's a push towards more synthesis between the social sciences and humanities. Um, and I think if I look at the three part you know, value that you described, the knowledge base, the utility base, if I may say so, and the constitutive part, they also apply, I would say, to the social sciences. And given the many challenges that we face, wouldn't it be better to, to join forces then with the social sciences rather than focusing on the exact differences that demarcate, you know, the social sciences from the humanities? And also because if I understood you correctly, if, you know, part of the social sciences are compatible with the humanities, the qualitative, you know, social scientists, whereas others are not, again, is that, is that doesn't have unintended consequences where it may not be in our interest. So my question uh, is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I do address in this in the final chapter also this push for SSH for social science and humanities as kind of academic, at least in the research and, and societal context. Uh, whether it is counterproductive to, to say, but nonetheless, there are different perspectives. I, yeah, uh, there certainly are, are multiple perspectives, but the kind of broader cluster of more, well, cultural uh, and insider involvement and personal engagement versus the kind of more sociological academic distance. And in the broader spectrum, the social sciences tend to be more and uh, have this more, um, well, empirically oriented kind of abstraction from personal preferences uh, than the humanities, I think. So uh, the collaboration is fine and, and, and pulling together in, in, the, as a, in the, well, political sphere. Uh, but I, I hope there's, or I hope I made a case for, for making a distinction still as well. All right, thanks. Um, and Nathal Dussing. Nathal Dussing. Yeah. Hello, me. everyone. Hello, Wim. Um, I've, I've got a question about the third value that you uh, mentioned. So about the humane humanities. Um, I was wondering where you placed uh, this within the humanity. So whether you place it within the humanities or outside uh, the scholarly enterprise or outside university. So if you want to revise culture or you have ideas about um, how to uh, create culture, do, do you come with your suggestions then within humanities or outside of it? And what, how does this relate to objectivity and uh, which is so highly valued? Yeah. Um... Oh, I should have had this discussion before writing the book. Uh, the various issues. Um, I, I think I, I speak about humane in the, when I start talking about what would be a singular and the word humanity is not a, an academic discipline, but has this moral connotation uh, of, of humaneness. Uh, I, I I tend to think, say, in the discussion, for instance, with the 
the last sheet, the two responses, that this ambition to be scholarly it should take precedence in a sense, and the and the partisan ambition is something we cannot avoid bringing to the table, and then should bring be explicit about. But but in it, it's it's that's more a civic than an academic interest, I would say. So it's outside outside yes. um, science. In the sense, then yeah. outside of the scholarly sphere, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it, 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 this will increasingly come under discussion. I think so. Then, 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 then you begin talking also about the role of the imagination in the humanities, mm -hmm. and what does it mean for building a society, and and it, it, it's also about involvement again. And I, for myself, I find it a very difficult uh, issue. So, of course, um, um, uh, yeah, it, it's politics again. Yes, but it also is indeed, well, going well, against my, my previous statement, maybe, uh, the position of, of the partisan or the particular interests uh, and the theology faculties are a traditional example of that, but it's it's it may also be in different forms of engagement. Mm -hmm. That that should not be, uh, well, kind of free sphere, not not confronting with with the academic one. Mm -hmm. So if it's outside, it sounds too easy. Uh, that's I think also uh, the re the response by by one other is that well, theology or religious studies. They should be close to one another. Should be still in encountering each other, confronting each other. Um, so I think we are we are we are getting near our uh, our final time, but I was perhaps I may may put one top final thing uh, to you, uh, Wim. What would you think of, of the following uh, approach for delineating uh, the various groups of sciences, the natural sciences, the social sciences, uh, the humanities, um, by saying, well, there are certain sorts of questions that, generally speaking, uh, the natural sciences are incapable of answering, but also the, the social sciences don't seem to have a, a handle on, whereas the humanities do seem to be capable of providing an intelligent answer. For instance, um, you know, simple things about the meaning of a particular word in a 17th century text. The social sciences just don't seem to have a handle on that. The natural sciences certainly don't have either. And that you could take this as a sort of model to delineate what demarcates, um, and, and I, I, I agree with you that, that the boundaries are, are vague, but to, to get at a sort of core of what humanities may be, you start from asking questions that it seems impossible that either the social sciences or the natural sciences have, um, have, a, cap have a capability for answering them. Yeah. Uh, when it's a particular group of questions, well, I'm, I'm, first I'm, I'm hesitant about saying, well, we're, the humanities are able to answer questions, uh, because the discussion always seems to go on again as well. So every answer is, is kind of intermediary state. Uh, and, and some of the, the example you give of the meaning of a particular word in a 17th century text or so is in a sense uh, a scientist might well kind of mathematically oriented one might say well I do statistical analysis and I look at many other texts and and was near there uh, they might even claim that uh, so I'm not sure talking in terms of questions you answer but well, if you try it in your book, that's that's most welcome. Uh, it was just a it's just an attempt to 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 talk about it. Um, yeah. So yeah. 
So, so what I've been trying to do, or what we've been trying to do, is to to draw up lists of questions um, that we do seem to be capable of answering. For some, you don't seem to need any academic inquiry whatsoever. For some, you surely uh, need uh, natural science, or you need uh, mathematics, or um, and for some, you surely do need something like the social sciences, broadly understood. But for others, it seems like yeah, it seems like yeah, the humanities. Well, perhaps these answers cannot be definitive. I think that was your point. But but they they still they do they do have the capacities or the techniques to at least come up with something that qualifies as an answer. Whereas if you just ask a mathematician now, you know, given what you know uh, from this from from your uh, field of expertise now. I'm going to put to you this question about this 17th century text and this particular the meaning of this particular word. Well, as a mathematician, he doesn't have much, or she doesn't have to, have, doesn't seem to have much to say about that. Uh, so, so when we were drawing up these these lists of questions, then, well, it, at least I felt it was suggestive. Yeah. Of a, well, of maybe a, of a maybe my my follow up would be, what makes these questions different from the the other ones? Absolutely. And I think then uh, yeah. you get back to the point of of this self-involvement or something like a philosophical anthropology as the area where uh, where it's the, the combination of external perspectives and being a person who who does something with knowledge and who acts in in the world with that knowledge uh, that that combination makes makes for uh, well a particular group of questions and maybe it's a more it need not cover everything, but it seems to me kind of way of of saying, well, why would particular domains, particular questions be different in kind? Uh, it's a bit yeah. like a, 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 an Escher drawing where someone is walking in a gallery and looking at paintings. And if you look well, the person is himself also in in the in the picture. And that kind of Double being the observer and being in the picture creates a kind of problem uh, in this Escher painting or etch. Uh, and I think that kind of, of double character, well, is a kind of philosophical problem that seems to me um, setting certain issues, a certain, well, making also the, the tension between objective and, and involved scholarship. Yeah, so I, I, I like that idea. Uh, uh, very much, and I, and I do think that you're absolutely right. That once you think, oh, here's a list of questions that that neither the social sciences or the natural sciences seem to be capable of addressing intelligently. Uh, the, the next step is to, to try to take a hard look on those questions and try to say what it is about them that makes them unanswerable or pre prima facie unanswerable for these broad uh, groups of sciences. And then what, what, I, what I think you might start to be seeing, or at least I seem to be starting to see that, is that um, these, uh, those questions are specifically um, um, fit for the humanities uh, to, to deal with them, because they have to do with meaning, with intentionality, and with value. Uh, and um, and certainly the the natural sciences. I mean, there is no physical theory that, or there's no physical law that has meaning uh, as one of its uh, uh, central notions. Uh, there is no physical theory that has um, intentionality, uh, value. I mean, it's just not there. Um, so physics is out for that reason. It's there are there, there are these. So if, if you think that disciplines and also groups of disciplines are characterized by the predicates they use, well, then you might, anyway, I'm just suggesting the path uh, that, that, we, that we are exploring. And I was just thinking, I was just asking, well, you thought about this as well. What, what would you think um, as, a, as a reviewer uh, of, um, of, well, of the general? Yeah, of terms like intentionality do, do involve the person. Uh, not just as as kind of objective phenomenon, but 
but as, as someone. So I think in the end, that comes very close to, very much to, to the same kind of philosophical uh, core issue in, in kind of thinking about human nature. Yeah. All right. So I don't want to uh, keep you all um, away from your dinners. Thanks very much, Wim, for, uh, for being with us and for giving your, your presentation. I think it was really lovely uh, and, and, and good and an important topic uh, for you to take on and to uh, um, and, and food for thought that you gave us all. So thanks very much. Uh, um, we read your book, at least the people in the, in the group, we read your book with, uh, with great interest. Um, so let's uh, clap our hands and uh, thank you very much. And all the others, thanks for tuning in and for um, uh, participating in, uh, in uh, listening, but also some of us talking and questioning. Well, thank you very much.